Hi everyone, in this video we'll go over a few things. So first off, the print uh, that is going on to my right, which looks beautiful. Uh, and I fixed a lot of small things uh, in this print and found a lot of uh, small things that needed to be improved on. And uh, the results speak for themselves, so uh, I'm really happy about it. And um, yeah, then we'll go over uh, jerk drive support. So uh, we're be working on that right now. And uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover regarding that. So uh, what work still needs to be done? What do we have already done? Uh, regarding board compatibility, we also have a few things to talk about because some of the things I have in mind that we have already slightly worked on may uh, even mean that we could be able to run this upgrade on a direct drive setup on the stock Ender 3 board. And this means that also this could be run on a lot of uh, stock 3D printer boards, uh, which would be absolutely huge. Um, and finally, we'll go over the filament flow sensor. Um, so I have a small dilemma right now. Um, should I try to do a version without it or is it absolutely required? Uh, so for now, I haven't built it yet, uh, but I'm already getting pretty good and pretty reliable uh, uh, print quality and print results uh, without using one. Uh, but having one may be a really nice feature to have so I, I still have to decide whether uh, to keep it or uh, to keep it as like default and absolutely necessary or to leave it as an option so this will, will be the, the things we're going to talk about in this video uh, so let's roll the intro and get right into it Okay, so first off, I want to take a look at the three models. So uh, this is the dragon that you just saw in the intro, and since you saw it in the intro, I don't want to spend too much time on that. But essentially, I printed two models uh, before getting good results, uh, and they failed for uh, clear reasons that I fixed and uh, that I have written down on the documentation to be careful about. Uh, so this one, um, uh, the weird pattern that you can see on the infill uh, and actually on the inside uh, is because I'm printing the body with transparent filament and I have wipe and infill enabled. That means that when it was transferring from orange to transparent, it was wiping it in the infill and then you can see it through the body. Uh, it's an interesting look, but not exactly what I was going for. Um, as you can see, it uh, didn't extrude in some spots and had some under extrusion. That was because I was testing this with uh, the merger as close to the extruder as possible. That meant that the PTFE tube joining the extruder with the merger was extremely small and that PTFE tube was actually bending to up to uh, 45 degrees I believe and uh, that's a really hard angle for, for a filament and for a bottom style setup. Uh, it's as if you took your bottom style tube and just cranked it at like 40 or 60 degrees. Uh, so it was causing extrusion problems. Uh, and I stopped the print at that point when I noticed those extrusion problems. I was, it's not worth finishing. This one was the second model. It's already much better in terms of extrusion, uh, but the extrusion is slightly uneven and um, it doesn't look great. Uh, so I, the, the, the main fix for this was to actually uh, retighten the uh, idler and to have a high tension. And I'm gonna need to add some visual markers on the idler body so that you know how much you need to tighten those screws. Um, and uh, regarding the layer skip at the very top, that's because uh, my bell tension was way, way, way too high with those little custom um, uh, bell tensioning system that I just reprinted. Uh, it's really easy to go too high and I noticed that the bed was basically not moving with that bell tension and uh, the motor was struggling to keep it, keep on with it. And uh, at that point, uh, it just skipped layer. And that's also because my Z-Hop was way too high. So it created a little bump in the print, the nozzle caught on it, the bed was just about to skip and that caused it to skip. Uh, so I had to pause the print there. And we are here to this uh, final model. So I tweaked the idler tension almost perfectly. The, the print and the extrusion quality is really good. Uh, it looks beautiful. There are all five filaments were used in this model. Uh, a lot, lot, lot of tool changes in this model as well. And uh, it took about uh, 14 hours to finish. Uh, the only small defect is that the uh, actual transition from black to cyan isn't perfect. That's because I reduced the uh, the uh, transition uh, and the, the amount you needed to extrude for the transition from black to other filaments. Uh, and I was too far from the stock settings. Uh, so that's something I'm gonna have to tweak um, if I do uh, some other print attempts. 
So yeah, that's basically it for the three models. Now we will go over the direct drive extrusion and the work I'm doing on that with uh, other people as well. Okay, so now we'll talk about direct drive support and the work that I and a couple of other people have been working on. Um, so as you can see, I've transitioned my Ender 3 to uh, a direct drive setup using some of the shelf parts. Uh, so a, a direct drive extrusion conversion kit and I've also changed the uh, actual extruding part to a, a full metal uh, extruder because the, the one that is in plastic that is made uh, on the, the stock printer actually usually breaks after a few months and I didn't want that to happen in this case uh, to not have any uh, extra delays. Uh, so the key element that we're going to need to add uh, for direct drive, at least on this printer, is a way to connect this extruder to a bone tube so that we can connect it to the MMU. Uh, there's an, going to be another possible uh, problematic point in the direct drive setup is how uh, well the gears are going to be able to grab the filament and then transition it to the actual extruder uh, because as you can see on the b-roll footage right now uh, there are a lot of points where the filament can slip out of the extruder assembly uh, and uh, we may need some extra physical modifications to avoid that. Um, so now, regarding board compatibility with the Direct Extruder, uh, if you do the calculations, we add one extra motor, we already need, needed five independent separate motor control, uh, now we're gonna need six. Uh, but that means that only boards like the SKR Pro would be compatible, and this is actually kind of bad in terms of price. Uh, so that's why um, me and Paul Lewis are working on a servo motor controlled idler, uh, which, which would mean that you would need one less stepper driver and which would mean that boards like the SKR V1.4 and a lot of uh, other boards would be compatible with this upgrade. Uh, but there's an extra thing that I've thought of and that could potentially work to make this compatible with basically any main board with a bit of tweaking, even the stock Ender 3 board, uh, because you could actually connect both extruders on the MMU and the direct drive, um, so the actual extruder, uh, to a Z splitter, so to regular motor splitter, but they use, usually use for double Z, and uh, actually control them both uh, simultaneously. Uh, the only problem, now that you may have thought of, is that we have a different steps per millimeter uh, between this extruder and the multimodal upgrade. And that's where we're gonna have to do a lot of software tweaking, um, so that we engage the MMU and disengage it as soon as the filament gets grabbed by the extruder uh, because otherwise the extruder and the MMU are going to be working against each other because one is going to be pushing way slower than the other uh, and it's going to cause just a lot of problems. Uh, so that means that if we get server compatibility and the Z splitter or the motor splitter works correctly, uh, we could make this compatible with something like the stock Ender 3 board because it has already two three GPIO pins, uh, so we only need one extra pin uh, to control the servo motor and um, the one could also be used for NAND stop or uh, some other things. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it on the direct drive support. So we're working on it, it's coming, um, but yeah, you, you should expect the build guide to be out uh, in uh, a month, maybe more. Uh, because university is starting again as well, so I'm gonna have to slow down a bit on my side. Um, and uh, yeah, so now we'll go over the filament flow sensor and whether or not you actually need it in the, let's say, final multi-material upgrade. Okay, so now we'll go over the filament flow sensor. I'm not gonna take too much time on that because I've already talked about it in my last video. Uh, but I had a decision process to make uh, right around now. Uh, regarding whether we needed it in the final release or not. So uh, a filament flow sensor would enable two things, being able to sense an error during loading and unloading and um, being able to trigger some kind of uh, error handling code uh, regarding that, uh, which meant that if we fail a load, we can try it again, try it again, and then beep and ask for the user to help. Um, and uh, the second thing is that during a regular print, it will be able to detect filament runout and filament jams uh, and clog nozzles. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a really nice feature to have, uh, but it's also going to be quite hard to implement. So uh, I haven't received the magnetic encoder yet, and uh, it's gonna require quite a bit of work. So um, I still think that it's a key feature to have this uh, as a really reliable um, solution for multi-material 3D printing. 
so I'm not going to release a tutorial until I have uh, completely um, develop the filament flow sensor. Now for the people that really want to build this now and that I don't have an extra printer, uh, already have experience coding inside Marlin, uh, or want to contribute, uh, I'm gonna make this uh, a build guide available for both side setups right now, but will most likely also do one for direct drive without the filament flow sensor. So uh, that would be an upgrade that would require a lot of work, a lot of tuning, and um, yeah, you would most likely definitely need help uh, either from me or other members of the Discord channel um, if you tr want to attempt it, but I'm gonna make this possibility. Uh, and I'm also gonna <laughs> keep working on the filament flow sensor. Um, and uh, yeah, so until we don't have the filament flow sensor perfectly working, I don't feel like it's uh, useful to release a tutorial. Uh, because it means that people that build it will most likely be deceived uh, because if your print fails it's not able to detect it and as you can see i've had two failed prints to my right for one successful print you waste a lot of filament inside the um, purging and wipe tower uh, so it's a uh, at the current state it's still a prototype and uh, as long as it doesn't have that filament flow sensor i don't think that it is um, ready to be used by anyone uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. So if you like this video, make sure to leave a like uh, and to subscribe if you're not subscribed yet. Uh, if you want to contribute to this project or just stay as up to date as possible, uh, then make sure to join the uh, Discord channel that I've linked below. Uh, this is I, I post frequent updates here. I post pictures of my multicolor model prints that are successful. Uh, you can send the features. If you have a problem building it, you can ask for help as well. Um, and yeah, they, it, basically, if we want to get in contact with me, this is the best way to do it. Um, and uh, yeah, I also have the GitHub link down below as well. If anyone wants to take a look at the code, at the files, at the 3D files, want to print the 3D files maybe. Uh, and the build guide is also on uh, GitHub. Okay, so that's pretty much it. I will see you guys next time.